Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Argonne National Laboratory. I'm Jeff Binder, the Associate Laboratory Director for Energy and Global Security, uh, which is the part of the laboratory that does a lot of what we call applied research that focuses on energy security, some national security issues, environmental protection, and nuclear energy, which is what you're going to hear about tonight. So I really appreciate all of you coming out and hearing. Uh, um, I'm always pleased to see these kinds of events and to see, see uh, the, the kind of a, yeah, attendance that's coming and seeing the kind of work we're doing. And I hope, I hope uh, you get excited about uh, what you hear tonight as is, is I get excited about it. So, so, so I'm really grateful for your support. Um, and I know Bo Fang and uh, Francesca Ganda, who are speaking tonight, are also uh, very appreciative of your support. Um, I, I want to say a couple things about Argonne before I bring our speakers up. So uh, last year was the 70th anniversary of the chartering of Argonne um, as a national laboratory. Um, and if, for those that don't know it, Argonne was the first national laboratory. It was uh, created uh, uh, to develop a peaceful use of nuclear energy. And you're going to hear about nuclear energy tonight, but um, one thing I would tell you is nearly all of the um, deployed nuclear technology that we see in the world today, different reactor ideas, different reactor concepts, almost all of it was really developed initially here um, by scientists and engineers here at Argonne. So I hope you're all uh, as proud as we are of the kind of contributions we've made in, uh, in coming from Illinois and the connection to the University of Chicago. So. Um, um, so you're kind of kind of hear about our, our legacy, but you're also going to hear a lot about um, how nuclear still can play a really important role in our energy future for for the country. So, um, in the, but let me just say a few more things about the laboratory. Over the last seven decades, we've really grown into a diverse laboratory and and research powerhouse. So there's about uh, 3,500 employees here. Um, we bring in about 8,000 collaborating researchers and scientists from all over the world and you know, various universities, uh, the private sector that come to, the, to this laboratory to take advantage of our facilities and, and access to our intellectual and scientific capabilities. Um, we, we, we've contributed to m many revolutionary energy breakthroughs. Um, we unravel some of nature's deepest mysteries and provide the nation's researchers with the most advanced large-scale tools of modern science. And just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, the building we're in has one of the five fastest uh, computers in the world. And just about two miles in that direction, we have a, a, a large kilometer ring called the Advanced Photon Source, which is a cyclotron which provides one of the brightest sources of x-rays for studying materials and characterizing materials. So just a little sense of the kind of capabilities that are right here in the Chicago suburbs. Um, Argonne has grown in, uh, and over these many years, over these last seven decades, but we've not, as you could guess, we've not lost touch with our roots in nuclear energy. And in fact, we've continually have grown and refined our expertise. And you're going to hear two of our real stars tonight talk about um, what they're doing. And they're here to talk about the latest and advanced reactors, what they are, how they work, the advantages they provide to the world's energy demand. Uh, and, and as you could guess, energy demand continues to rise. And, uh, and so um, I, hope, I hope you find this uh, is educational and, and um, and stimulating as, as, uh, as I do and the importance of these issues. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to just uh, uh, do a brief introduction of our speakers. Our second speaker tonight is going to be Bo Feng. I'll talk about him first. He's been with Argonne since 2011. He's a nuclear engineer. Um, and he uh, has been recognized for various awards in his career, but um, He's, he, but he was recognized for the Nuclear Energy Fuel Cycle R&D Excellence Award, and you're going to under, hear more about fuel cycles here in a few minutes, in 2014. Uh, so as you could tell by that, by that name, Bo conducts research in, in looking at the nuclear fuel cycle and developing and using the nuclear, uh, and develop and uses these advanced uh, computer codes that are applied to studying the nuclear fuel cycle. And I suspect he does calculations on that computer that's in this building right here. 
Um, a lot of his work is used to inform the government and the Department of Energy on policy and technology decisions. Bo also does uh, research in, in what we call reactor physics, uh, analyzing uh, uh, core design and the conver high conversion of, of water reactors and fast reactors. And so you're going to hear a little bit about reactor technology, not only the fuel and how we manage the fuel that goes into a reactor, but how we actually operate reactors from the reactor core. He received his doctorate in nuclear science and engineering from MIT. And, uh, and I don't know when that was. There's no date on here, but uh, he's a pretty young guy, so it wasn't too long ago. Um, our, our first speaker is going to be Francesco Ganda. Um, uh, he's also a nuclear engineer here at Argonne, and he leads uh, a number of research activities in the area of nuclear economics. So you're going to hear about the reactor design and how we design it, but also how how we look at the economics of nuclear. And uh, he's also part of the fuel cycle team across the country from various laboratories and universities that look at nuclear. Uh, Francesco, uh, uh, prior to joining Argonne in 2013, was a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, where he studied the neutronic properties of water-cooled fast reactors. And he was also been a staff scientist at the Idaho National Laboratory, where he focused there also on the economics of nuclear fuel cycles. Uh, Francesco received his doctorate in nuclear engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. So without uh, any further ado, let me uh, hand the mic over to Francesco and have him kick off the evening. Francesco will go first, followed by Bo. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Jeff. So good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. So um, the talk of today is divided in two parts. And um, the part on advanced reactors will be discussed by my colleague and fellow nuclear engineer, Dr. Bo Feng. Well, I will talk about um, the current status of nuclear energy and uh, how the current fleet of nuclear reactors work. But before I do that, uh, let me spend a couple words about uh, the history of nuclear reactors and nuclear technology, which of course is strongly intertwined uh, with our national laboratory here tonight. So um, the very first nuclear reactor ever in the world was called Chicago Pile One. It was part of the Manhattan Project and uh, was built under the abandoned uh, football field at the University of Chicago, was Stag Field Football Stadium and uh, was built by the Metallurgical Lab, which was managed by the University of Chicago, and um, uh, essentially started operation in uh, 1942. So um, the Metallurgical Labs were established uh, just a little bit before that, in February 1942, so that reactor was built pretty quickly. And um, it's important because the metallurgical labs, in fact, are the predecessor of our uh, laboratory today. In fact, this year, we celebrate also the 75th recurrence of, uh, of this foundation. Uh, then uh, there was some concern about having a nuclear reactor within the Chicago city limit, and so Chicago Pile 1 was actually disassembled and rebuilt, a little improved, they put a shielding around it, for example, uh, not far from here as Chicago Pile 2 uh, in the Argonne Forest. Uh, it's, it's known as Site A in the Red Gate Woods uh, at the Palos Forest Preserve. And if you haven't seen it, it's worth a, a visit there. It's a memorial of uh, importance for nuclear energy. Uh, the laboratory, uh, per se, as Jeff pointed out, was actually established formally in uh, July 1946, and that was the very first uh, U.S. national laboratory. Uh, now, from that point forward, um, uh, every pretty much uh, advancement that happened in nuclear energy had the involvement of argon in it. So, for example, in the early 50s, uh, argon and Westinghouse together co-developed the first submarine reactor that propelled the USS Nautilus, the very first... Uh, nuclear submarine in history. So um, that technology, that advancement, eventually led to the development of uh, the, the most common uh, nuclear reactor technology we have in use today, which is the pressurized water reactor. About two-thirds of the worldwide fleet is pressurized water reactor deriving from this uh, technology developed for the Nautilus, and also about two-thirds of the U.S. fleet. Another example, in the early 50s, uh, Argonne conducted experiments uh, both here on site 
in Building 331, and also uh, uh, in Idaho at the site that was run by Argon scientists, uh, was called Argon West, uh, the experimental breeder reactor that proved the stability of boiling water in a core, and that developed the underlying technology for the second most common type of reactor we have in use today, which is the boiling water reactor. Okay, that's about one, the remaining one third of the U.S. fleet and about 17 percent of the worldwide fleet. Uh, just to mention another example of importance, uh, in December 1951, uh, Argon also built at the Idaho site. Uh, CP4, or uh, Experimental Breeder Reactor 1, which was the very first reactor to generate uh, usable electricity. And in fact, some of you might have seen this famous picture here with the four light bulbs that um, uh, were, for the very first time in history, illuminated with nuclear-produced electricity. Okay? So from those beginnings, where are we today? Uh, well, nuclear experienced a tremendous expansion from the uh, early 70s over the decades. Uh, with uh, commercial production of large, large reactors, large machines. And today we have almost 450 large commercial power reactors in 31 countries, producing almost 11% of the worldwide electricity that's produced and consumed every single day. So massive amount of electricity from nuclear energy. And it's growing. In fact, we have 60 more reactors under construction. Uh, this graph here shows the blue lines are the operational ones, and the greens are uh, the, the ones under construction. And we see that most of the new constructions, in fact, are happening in Asia and in Central and Eastern Europe. In fact, of the 60 reactors, about 20 are being built in China. And in the US, we are only building four. So in a way, we lost the leadership in this field. So there's going to be more, uh, more uh, reactors that are needed. In fact, there's currently about 1.3 billion people that have no access to electricity worldwide. And as the standard of living improves for those people, of course, electricity, clean water are essentials uh, for their development. Uh, also, uh, global energy demand is projected to grow 50% by 2040 uh, as both the population in increases and their standard of living approaches Western standards. Also, nowadays, we have uh, a large number of research reactors. Those are not used to produce electricity, but they are used for research, various purposes. And also, uh, we have a large number of naval reactors for marine propulsion. So where are we in the US? As Jeff pointed out, just point, um, we have um, about 20% of our electricity produced with uh, nuclear energy. So uh, it's about twice the world average in terms of fractional electricity produced with nuclear power. And uh, in some states, uh, including Illinois, we produce more than 50% with, um, with nuclear power. And in particular, in Illinois, we have uh, 11, 12 reactors, 11 reactors at six power stations. And together, they produce 12 million kilowatt of capacity. That's a large amount of power. It's enough to power about 8.6 million homes. So that's larger than any other state in the United States, in the country. So we are really, truly here, the nuclear state. Okay. So uh, what are those reactors that I've been talking about? So my favorite definition is that a reactor is a volume of space where we have a nuclear reaction happening. So um, how do they look like? So here I'm just showing a couple schematics of the most common uh, technologies that we have in use today, a PWR here and the boiling water reactor here, both uh, developed at Argon, if you remember from the previous slide. So um, where we have actually the reaction happening is down here. This is called the core. And, um, um, that's, um, and the rest here, it's essentially hardware. Those are control rod drives to, uh, to maneuver the reactor. They, their control rods can be inserted in the core to essentially shut it down or turn it on and to change the power level. And then everything is closed into a large container, which is called a pressure vessel. And we have those nozzles here that essentially are needed for water. Water, why do we need water? Water is needed to take the heat that's the primary purpose of our reaction. It's generated here in the reactor per se, in the reactor core, and we take that heat and transfer it out of the reactor to some machinery that turns that heat into electricity, into usable electricity. So the nozzles here are for getting the water in, the water goes through the core, and then gets out of those nozzles to get to those machinery for the conversion. So in BWR, it's similar. The core is right here, and then you have the control rods are inserted from the bottom. Okay, so the reaction we are interested in is this. 
This is our main nuclear reaction. We are reacting neutrons, this N here, with uranium, and a particular type of uranium that has this label 235 here, and I'll tell you uh, in the next slide what that means. So uh, once a neutron essentially captures a uranium atom, um, sorry, a uranium atom captures a neutron, then uh, the nucleus actually gets excited and um, gains enough energy to fall apart. Okay, that process of falling apart is called fission, and we have uh, then it's two pieces essentially that uh, remain out of the of the nucleus. So they're called fission products. They are distributed all over the middle of the periodic table. So there are several hundreds possible combination of fission products. And uh, this, this cesium and rubidium are just examples, but they can be um, a lot of different combinations. Okay, very importantly, uh, this process releases a couple neutrons, two to three, on average 2.45, and also a large amount of energy, uh, the, uh, the approximately 200 mega electron volts. Now, to give you a sense of how much that energy is, we can compare it to uh, the combustion of hydrocarbons. So most of us drove here tonight with uh, our gasoline-powered cars. And uh, there, we essentially use um, uh, gasoline, which is a mixture of hydrogen and carbon atoms, mostly. And when we, uh, and we react those with, um, with oxygen to essentially um, uh, generate heat. And when we do that, when we react one carbon atom or one hydrogen atom with an oxygen atom, we release about three to four electron volts. So if this down here was the energy released by your um, combustion of one hydrocarbon atom, how big would the energy be released by the fissioning of a uranium-235 atom? This big, okay? So it's a large amount of energy on an atomic scale. However, it's uh, very, very small on a, for, for our sensory experience, for example. In fact, if we had a fission happening in the palm of our hand right now, we wouldn't feel absolutely anything. Okay? We would need about, uh, the quick calculation would be about a billion fission per second to start feeling a little bit of heat in the palm of our hand. And in fact, in the core of our reactor, we typically need about trillions fission in a small volume to, to generate the type of heat that we need to, to power uh, to generate substantial amount of electricity. So large amount of uh, energy on, on an atomic scale, but small on a sensory scale. Okay, so we need uh, uranium and neutrons for this reaction. So where do we get the neutrons from? Uh, we get them from here, okay? So uh, we are lucky that we have more than one neutron coming out of this process uh, because some are going to be lost. Some are going to simply leak out of my reactor. Some are going to be absorbed in other stuff that's not this uh, uranium-235 that I'm shooting for. So some are going to be absorbed. You remember from my uh, plot in the previous slide, some are going to, there's steel there. Some are going to be captured in the steel. Some are going to be lost in the water that goes through the core. Some are going to be lost in previous fission products. Some are going to be lost in control rods. The control rods are absorbing material that slow down the neutrons, that, uh, slow down the reaction by absorbing neutrons. So uh, we are going to lose some. So if I do my job right as a nuclear reactor designer, I essentially need to make sure that at least one neutron makes it from here back to here. Okay. So in that case, if that happens, then this process can keep going very smoothly by itself for a very long time at steady state as long as I have uh, uranium-235 in my system that I can keep fissioning. And if that happens, we call this criticality. We call reactor critical, which I know it's not a very fortunate term because we think critical, we think someone laying in a hospital bed in a bad shape. But for a reactor, it's a good thing. It's essentially meaning that uh, this keeps going by itself uh, for a long time. Okay. Typically, our reactors now run on cycles of about 18 months, so that's uh, a year and a half. You can, you can run them quite long. So now we know where the neutrons come from. Where do we get the uranium from? Well, uranium is a mineral, so it needs to be taken out of the ground like any other mineral, like uh, iron or, or coal. Okay. So how diffuse is uranium? Is it like diffused in some spots or is everywhere? Uh, well, it turns out that uh, uranium is pretty much everywhere. It's very diffuse. So this is a map from the US uh, ge uh, Geological Survey that shows the uranium concentration by county. And uh, there are spots where the uranium, there's not much uranium, and there are spots where there's more uranium. And of course, if you want to start a mining operation, you're better off doing it where there's a large amount of uranium, so your operations are going to be more economical. 
Uh, one thing that's not mentioned here is that uranium also is diffused in any body of water. You're going to have uranium in rivers, lakes, and oceans. In fact, the, uh, the concentration in oceans is not that large, but oceans being so big, if we could actually extract uranium from the oceans, we would have uranium for thousands of years at current consumption. And in fact, some countries have uh, active programs of research in trying to extract uranium from seawater in an economical way. Now, one problem uh, with uh, uranium is that when we get it out of the ground, natural uranium comes in this composition. So the uranium that we like a lot for our current reactors is this uranium with the label 235 that we mentioned before. Unfortunately, that's less than 1% of the uranium we get from the ground. It's actually, to be precise, 0.7%. To be precise, precise is 0.711. And it doesn't change much between various countries and various mines worldwide. Okay. So the remaining 99.3%, so the vast majority of the uranium, is really this other type. 238. Okay, so what are those two numbers, 235 and 238? It's the combined amount of neutrons and protons in uh, my, our nucleus. Now, if you remember uh, your chemistry classes from some of us, might be a couple years back, um, there's, uh, the nucleus is described any atom as a, as a planetary model. So there's a nucleus in the center that has protons and neutrons, and then there's uh, electrons orbiting around it. Okay, so, um, we, in chemistry, all we care about is the amount of protons. Okay? We normally ignore the neutrons. And that's, the reason is because all the, all the chemical elements in the periodic table are uniquely defined by the amount of protons they have in their, in their nucleus. So uranium, by virtue of being uranium, has exactly 92 protons. But uh, we, in, nuclear, in the nuclear field, in nuclear physics, nuclear reactor theory, and so on, we care also a lot about neutrons. And those two happen to have a different amount of neutrons in their core. And by virtue of that, it's a complicated thing about nuclear physics, so I'm not going to explain why. But this one fissions easily, and this one does not fission very easily. Easily means that if you have a slow neutron approaching the nucleus, it just captures it and falls apart. This one needs a pretty speedy neutron to hit it very strongly so it falls apart. Once you manage to fission, uh, this one also releases sim a similar amount of energy as this one. If, so in fact, it, does, uh, it would make a lot of sense to try to design systems that, uh, that actually can use uh, this uranium because the vast, vast majority is actually this. And in fact, we'll hear more about advanced system that actually can take advantage of this type of uranium more than our current fleet uh, from Dr. Feng in a little bit. Okay, so but uh, the bottom line is that for, uh, for if you get uranium from the mine, this is the composition you get. And um, it turns out that it's very difficult to make a reactor out of this composition of uranium. In fact, it can be done. And uh, for example, if you remember the Chicago Pile 1, the very first reactor ever built, was actually running on natural uranium. Also, our colleagues, to the, uh, our, our friends to the north, the Canadians, have a, um, a fleet of commercial reactors that's, that can run on natural uranium. The can do's can do that. But we in the United States decided instead to use uh, normal water as a, as a thermal vector, so it, the one that uh, is the, the medium that takes the heat out of the core and delivers it to the power conversion system. So if you have normal water in your core, it turns out that it's impossible or close to impossible to make a reactor with natural uranium because water captures too many neutrons. So you don't have the single neutron going back to the other side and sustaining the reactor. So you cannot, essentially you cannot run it. So uh, in the United States, for our, for our fleet, we need to increase the fractional amount of uranium-235 for our fleet, typically to the order of 5% nowadays, so we can run for 18 months. And that process is called enrichment, and it's a, uh, a technological advanced and, uh, and pretty expensive process. But we do it routinely on a commercial level in the United States. So once we have our enriched uranium, what do we do with it? We turn it into an oxide, which is essentially a, a black powder. It looks like this. And then we take another um, uh, high-tech process. It's called sintering. We press that powder at very high pressure and very high temperature and make tiny pellets that look like this. They are beautiful objects, and they are manufactured to a very high degree of precision and mechanical tolerance. Okay, so, uh, And they are ceramic. 
Then uh, they are about an e half an inch long and half an inch in diameter or so, pretty small. Then we stack them in very long pipes, uh, tubes. Those are called fuel elements that are 12 feet long. So we stack those uh, little pellets in those tubes. They used to be make, made of stainless steel, but stainless steel uh, has iron in it, and iron tends to capture neutrons. So now we use a different alloy. It's called zirc alloy. Zirconium is, is much, uh, much less... Um, uh, difficult to deal with in terms of neutron capturing. We want to save as much neutrons as we can in the core. And so now we use zirc alloy. And then for easy of handling, we essentially put together those rods into something that's called the fuel assembly. And um, that looks like this. So if you look at the map here, this is one of the maps from one of my calculations. So you see here the red dots are the fuel assembly seen from above the fuel elements seen from above. And then there are empty spaces here for essentially the control rods insertions. The con oops. I pressed the wrong button. The control rods uh, look like this. So they can be slided in and out of those assemblies to control the reaction as needed. And they go in the, into those empty channels here. And uh, the central channel here is for instrumentation. So we put neutron detectors in there. So in the control room, they know how many neutrons they have in each assembly in each point of the reactor. By the way, just one note here. Um, this is how new fuel looks like when it's uh, just uh, manufactured and shipped to a new reactor. And after five years, um, then the uranium-235 will be pretty much all gone and will be turned into fission products. And uh, so this then becomes nuclear waste. And nuclear waste looks exactly like this. So I, I'm just telling you this because sometimes I hear people telling me that nuclear waste is some form of green slime that's in yellow canister. It uh, it's instead looks like this, OK? Uh, then we, uh, we stack those, we, um, we arrange those uh, assemblies more or less in a cylindrical shape, considering that they are square, we do our best. And we, uh, we arrange it in a cylindrical shape, and, and this is our core. This is our reactor. That's it. It's 12 feet tall, and it looks uh, like this. So then, once we have that, how do we make electricity out of this? So these are the two uh, type of reactors we have in the US. This is a PWR um, that's two thirds of the fleet. And this is a BWR that's one third of the fleet. Both were developed here at Argonne. So uh, in, this, uh, in the BWR, the, here is our core where we have those fuel elements 12 feet long that, that become hot. And then we pump uh, liquid water at the bottom of the core. The water goes along the, the, the fuel rods, vertical like this, and uh, take, takes the heat out of those fuel rods and, um, and boils by doing that. So then it becomes steam, and then the steam can enter a turbine and spins the blades. And then uh, the turbine drives the generator that makes electricity for us. And once the, once the steam leaves the turbine, essentially it's condensed back into liquid water by contacting it with um, pipes containing cold water, taken typically from some form of um, uh, body of water, large body of water, typically rivers or lakes, or if you have an ocean nearby, you can use the ocean. Now, PWRs are very similar, except that uh, the water that goes through the core does not boil. So it remains liquid, and it instead gives the heat out to another water that boils, which is the secondary loop here. Uh, so this water essentially stays liquid by virtue of very high pressure. It's, it's a high temperature, but uh, by virtue of very high pressure, it's about 2,250 PSI. So you can compare that to the 35 PSI in the tires of your car. So uh, takes the heat out, uh, comes out here, and then gives the heat away in this uh, device that's called the steam generator that then boils the water in the secondary loop, and the rest of the, of the circuit is the same. OK, so those two machines have done a great deal of good for our societies over the decades. In fact, uh, they have provided a, an energy source that's been dependable and affordable. And also, uh, we have had no, uh, our air now is better because of those machines. Uh, essentially, they have no toxic emissions. There's no stack here. There's no pipe. So you don't see any of the uh, pollutants that are associated with the combustion of fossil fuels, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, or even carbon dioxide. In fact, nuclear is the largest carbon-free source uh, worldwide and also in the United States. In the United States, it produces about 60% of our carbon-free electricity. And the vast majority of the rest is hydro. Small uh, wind and solar are still a small fraction of, uh, of total energy uh, produced. Also, uh, this, these machines have been safe. We have, uh, we have now thousands of years of reactor experience in uh, running those machines since the 70s. And someone calculated worldwide, we have about 17,000 years 
of React or operational experience. So we know how to run those machines pretty safely and smoothly. Also, they have provided a, a sustainable energy source. They, they have limited the depletion of fossil fuels, and also uh, they have limited our dependence of fossil fuels. Of course, if we make electricity with nuclear, we don't need to burn coal or, or gas or even oil. Okay. So now the next question becomes, uh, they have been doing great, but when we think about the next generation of reactors, many of these are actually aging and becoming pretty old. So when we think about the next generation of reactors, can we do even better than this? Can we improve on various aspects? And this is the question for my colleague, uh, Dr. Bo Feng. So please help me in welcoming him to. Thank you, Dr. Ganda. So, what are these advanced reactors that we keep talking about? Well, they're pretty much any design that's not currently in wide use today. So a nuclear reactor, they can be designed with many different combinations of fuels, materials, different coolants, uh, even different geometries. Uh, currently, we use water, as mentioned, uh, but you can go with gas or liquid metal or even liquid salt. Uh, currently, we use enriched uranium, but you can also use thorium fuels or even recycle the enriched uranium uh, in the form of plutonium. Uh, they can, they're currently used in cylindrical pins, but it doesn't mean it has to be that shape. They could be spherical, or they could be even molten fuels, which is the fuel particles mixed in with the liquid coolant itself. So the combination of these key design parameters ultimately determines what we call the energy spectrum of the neutrons, or the energy distribution. Uh, us reactor physicists, we care about neutrons. They're important because they're the ones that cause the chain reaction. So we spend a lot of effort and energy and resources calculating exactly where they are, how many there are, and what kind of reactions uh, they're undergoing. Because ultimately, this neutron spectrum determines the performance of the reactor, and in some aspects, the fuel cycle. So this graph here shows you an example of what the neutron spectra look like for various designs. On the y-axis here is the relative number of neutrons, let's say. And here is the energy of these neutrons. So in a fast reactor, uh, by the way, I should mention that there are two main types of spectra for the reactors, fast and thermal or slow neutrons. So fast just means that the neutrons are very high speed and they're not slowed down. So they're still at the energies at which they're born through the fission process, close to about 200 mega electron volts in terms of kinetic energy. But um, that, that's total energy released actually from the fission products and the neutrons. The neutrons themselves are about two to four uh, mega electron volts. Uh, in thermal reactors, like the water reactors that we currently use today, the water, uh, the exposed hydrogen from the water molecule slow down the neutrons, so you get this kind of cascading gradient shown in the green here, and you have this thing called a thermal bump. And not mentioned very often is uh, some reactors in between, I like to call them intermediate or mixed spectrum, um, so you can have a little bit of mix of both. So where are we in terms of the advanced reactors um, from a time scale point of view? Well, currently, we're operating in the US about 100 reactors, and they're built in the 70s, 80s, and some in the 90s. Uh, generation two and generation three large uh, nuclear reactors. The ones, the four that are being built today, we'd call them generation three plus. And the advanced reactors that I'm specifically talking about would be generation four. So they're still maybe a couple decades away from large scale commercial deployment. So just some historical context first. These advanced designs that we're talking about actually aren't that really new. So during the 1950s and 60s, there was a golden age of reactor innovation, the atomic age. And a lot of designs, all the designs that you could think of or imaginable were not only conceived, but actually built, uh, including here at Argonne, where much of this uh, nuclear activity was uh, taking place. And this was largely attributed to um, uh, a large support from both the energy and um, defense departments uh, in order to win uh, what they consider life or death race uh, against the Soviets. So similar to the race against the moon. Uh, but then shortly after that period, the head of the US Navy uh, nuclear development program decided that we would only use uh, light water reactors in uh, the naval propulsion for submarines and aircraft carriers. So this is kind of when the age of innovation and creativity kind of um, ended. So. This experience and technology and infrastructure that we developed through the military uh, infrastructure uh, was then applied, since it was already there, for large-scale civilian use on land. And 
the LWRs, the light water reactors, light water is just normal water. Uh, the light water reactors have been operating successfully in the US. Um, but again, we asked the question, are they the best that we can do and were they the best decision that we made at the time? So now I'll give you a few examples of some of these advanced reactors. And each of them were designed specifically uh, for unique uh, challenges or for specific, for specific benefits. Um, for example, in the sodium cooled fast reactor, which we have a lot of experience here at Argonne, uh, it uses sodium as a coolant instead of water because sodium is much heavier, so it doesn't slow down the neutrons as much, so you're able to have uh, a fast spectrum. And the advantages of this fast spectrum I'll touch on a little bit later. In addition, sodium has an 800 Celsius degree range that stays at liquid water, uh, liquid uh, form, instead of being uh, boiled or frozen into solid. And so this is a very good coolant. It has very high thermal conductivity. And I could keep going about sodium, but let's be fair to the other types of designs. Uh, another design is the molten salt reactor. And I should mention that the fuel here in the sodium fast reactor is very similar. It's pin cylindrical shape. But here in the molten salt reactor, the fuels are actually particles of salt, uranium in salt form. Um, and it's mixed in with different types of salts as the coolant. So instead of having stationary fuel, your fuel is actually moving through this loop. And when it goes through the core of the reactor, there's graphite moderators in there to slow the neutrons down so that you can have these chain fission reactions. But once they leave the core, it's subcritical. The chain reaction stops. So the advantage of this type of design is you can keep fueling it while you're operating. And also, it's similar to the sodium uh, coolant, also operates at atmospheric pressure on the inside. So you don't have to pressurize it like you do with the uh, water coolants. Another type, or I guess category of advanced reactors is small modular reactors. Now these can be any type of coolant or fuel type. They just have to be small enough that you can manufacture them en masse in a, fab in a factory and then ship or transport them to the location on site. This is very different how we do it currently, which is we assemble the materials, transport them, and then construct the large reactors on site. So the idea of this is to try to save on the capital costs of your nuclear um, infrastructure through economy of size. Some other designs. The very high temperature reactor, they're gas-cooled reactors. Gas can also be used as a coolant. In this design, it's helium-cooled. And these, gas, uh, these gases can reach very high temperatures to the point where they're high enough to not only just generate electricity, but also to use them for high temperature industrial processes, such as hydrogen production. So in this type of design, you have a industrial uh, hydrogen production plant coupled to your power plant. The supercritical water reactor is, by its name, a reactor that still runs on water, but it's not a gas or a liquid. It's actually a fluid that is a mixture of both it's at a high enough pressure and temperature where it becomes what we call supercritical water. And the advantage of this one is when you run supercritical water fluid directly into the turbine, you increase your thermal efficiency from 33% to 45, maybe close to 50%. Thermal efficiency is the measure of how much of the thermal energy generated in the core can we translate into electrical power. So, uh, this thermodynamic process is, is everywhere that has energy generation, for example, in your car. Like, did you know that most of that energy is dissipated through heat through the hood of your car and not actually used to power the vehicle? And this is just uh, based on the um, secondary side in, in laws of thermodynamics. Another one is the pebble bed reactor. And this reactor was designed to be virtually meltdown proof. Instead of having cylindrical rods, it has spherical form shaped fuel. It's little particles of the fuel inside a graphite matrix, and it's operated at low power density so that it will never, under accident conditions, reach a temperature where the fuel will melt. And the spherical form has an advantage of high surface to volume ratio compared to a cylinder, so that when it does need to cool down, it can do it very efficiently and quickly. So these are just a small example of the different kinds of reactors that we can uh, design. Um, and so, they all, the, the common thread is they can all fit into whether they're a fast or thermal spectrum reactor. And we know that based on these physics, the advanced fast reactors have the highest potential benefit in terms of reducing the amount of waste and reducing the amount of fuel that you need. So what exactly are these fast reactors and, and how, are they, how are they different? So during each neutron interaction, as Dr. Ghana demonstrated, um, the faster the neutron hits the uranium atom, the more 
additional neutrons, subsequent neutrons, are produced. He said about two to three. So for fast neutrons, the number is closer to three. Um, so these additional neutrons then get absorbed by the surrounding fertile nuclei, which is U-238, or in the thorium cycle, thorium-232. And then after those fertile nuclei capture the neutron, they become a different uh, isotope and a different element, plutonium and uranium-233, which also have high fission probabilities, so you are thereby generating more fuel. So this conversion process still occurs in the thermal reactors, but because the neutrons are slower, they release fewer neutrons, so there's less excess neutrons to create this fuel. Uh, so the ratio of the number, amount of fuel that you produce per that initial atom that you, that nuclei that you fissioned is actually less than one. So we call that a conversion ratio uh, less than one. And in fast reactors, because of the additional neutrons and absorption of those neutrons in fertile material, you can actually create more fuel than you consume. So that's why we call those reactors with um, conversion ratios greater than one breeder reactors. So because of these physics, the fast reactor fuel cycle uh, is able to be fully closed, or you can completely recycle the, um, uh, all of the heavy metals, the actinides, in your fuel. In thermal reactors, there's possible recycling as well, but this is limited because the quality of that fuel diminishes over time. This is a schematic of the nuclear fuel cycle. As Dr. Ghana mentioned, you mine the uranium uh, as ore, enrich it, fabricate it, put it through the reactor, and then what goes in must come out, and you ultimately dispose of the entire assemblies into a geologic repository. In a fast reactor system, the quality of the fuel actually improves over time. So initially what you would do is take the used fuel from the LWRs, from the current reactors, only dispose of the fission products and recover the minor act the, the actinides, and then fabricate it into advanced uh, fast reactor fuel, run it to a fast reactor, and then those actinides can be continuously recycled in a closed loop. So sometimes the uh, extra uranium that's not needed can be used to be re-enrichment, but eventually this closed system is standalone to the point where you don't need enrichment anymore. Um, the only inputs into this circular uh, flow is natural uranium or U-238, and what comes out is just the residual waste, the, the fission products. So with this closed fuel cycle, with recycling of fuel in nuclear reactors, you can reduce the amount of uranium consumption by 99%, and you reduce the amount of high-level waste, which is the spent nuclear fuel, by 95% compared to what we're currently doing. So some context about how much fuel you would need to f feed this system. So if we completely switch the fast reactors just overnight, just like that, all 100 reactors turn into fast reactors, how much fuel would we need? Well, in a continuously recycling uh, fast reactor system, um, they only would require 100 tons of uranium-238 to produce the same amount of electricity that we're currently generating, which is about 20% of all the electricity in the US. And that's about 90 gigawatt years, or 790 billion kilowatt hours. Let's say the density of this uh, uranium fuel is in zirconium form, which is about 10 grams per cubic centimeter. That would be roughly about 10 one meter cubes. So that's what it would look like compared to a, a unit six foot man. And the U.S. has already produced 480,000 tons of this through the enrichment process, because when you enrich something, there's also the stream that's not as enriched. We call that tails, or depleted uranium. And that is over 99.7% of U-238. So without mining any additional uranium from the ground, if we use this, we can power our current fleet for the next couple eons. So similarly, what goes in must come out, right? So after putting in these 10 boxes, um, these 10 boxes of uranium zerk, uh, you would have approximately the same amount, more or less, in terms of the fission products. And that's about 100 tons of high-level waste uh, per year for this fleet. So how much of this waste have we uh, generated so far in the US? Uh, we've been operating nuclear power plants since the 1950s. Um, they're providing 20% of our power. All the nuclear waste that we've generated, if you stack them next to each other, eight foot high, would only fit one football field, one 100 yard football field. Had we been recycling this entire time, we would only 
use, we would remove about 95% of it, so the only waste you would have would be the fission products at about the five yard line. And there's a difference between these waste forms as well. So the 95% is actually actinides, the heavy metals that you can continue to recycle. The remaining 5% are fission products. And this is a chart showing the differences in relative radio tox radiological toxicity. These are logarithmic scale, so every increment is a magnitude, order magnitude, or 10 times larger. Same thing with the years. So initially, right after discharge, the fission products dominate in terms of the radio toxicity. So that's why you hear about things like cesium and iodine. But then, after about 100 years, it immediately decreases because of the radioactive decay. The half-lives of these fission products are much shorter. So after about 300 years or so, you reach the natural uranium ore levels you find in the ground without any human um, you know, uh, modifications of this material. However, these actinides, they can last hundreds of thousands of years before they reach this natural background level. So since fast reactors can continuously recycle these actinides, you're removing these long-lived actinides from a geological repository and keeping them in the reactor continuously. So this significantly benefits um, our long-term storage. Uh, th this greatly reduces the amount of long-term storage challenges that we have if we only have to worry about these five-yard line fission products for only a couple hundred years instead of hundreds of thousands of years. And this is just a, a list of historical and current operating fast reactors. As you can see, we've built the first few in the US. EBR2 was the last one um, that we operated here at Argonne, and we had a lot of, we had a very good program here getting a lot of um, information and, and uh, testing capabilities for fast neutrons. But that was shut down in 1994, uh, arguably for political reasons. So since then, we kind of relinquished uh, our leadership in this field, and much of the new ones and the ones that are currently operating are in countries like India, Japan, China, and Russia. And they're building another one here too. So are we going to build any more in the future? Um, what, what does it look like in terms of advanced reactors? Well, there's a couple in discussion right now on the commercial side in the US. But a lot of these, again, are all over the rest of the world. Uh, Argon is helping a lot with this one, the PGSFR, that's to be built in South Korea. It's metallic fuel, sodium-based, and so we're, they're utilizing a lot of our experience, uh, technology, um, and capabilities to help them with their design work. And another one that's not on this list, actually, is, is really interesting. It's currently um, a bill in the Senate that's, that originally was in the House. It was co-sponsored by both parties. It's not just one person. There's actually 12 from one, one party and eight from another. So there's very good bilateral support now for nuclear energy and nuclear um, research. And this is a fast neutron test reactor, and they're currently um, making scoping studies to determine whether there's a need uh, to build one of these in the US. So hopefully, um, you know, that will get some traction. I'll be very excited to work on it because, um, you know, we got to catch up to these Soviets. But there's not just activity on the government side. Uh, there's been a lot of activity recently on the private sector in the form of nuclear reactor startups in the last 10 years. Uh, people, I guess, um, were tired of waiting and realized the benefits of uh, carbon-free energy, such as nuclear, with base load power. So uh, a lot of these startups have been popping up all over the country using all the different reactor, advanced reactor design types that I mentioned previously. Some of these are partially supported by the government, but a lot of these are from private investors. Bill Gates, for example, is one of the major investors in TerraPower. Um, but there also is a current program um, through the Department of Energy in which these reactor startups can partner with national laboratories like Argonne. Um, we can offer them to use our facilities, help them design their reactors using our codes and experience, and help get these designs off the ground. And this is called the GAIN program. And Argonne is a great place, is, is a perfect place for, for such activities as these because uh, we have a very diverse spectrum of uh, experience in terms of uh, advanced reactor design. We not only design the core and do the physics modeling calculations, but we also have the fifth fastest computer that's able to run these complex fluid dynamic simulations. We have a very good uh, nuclear chemical department that does, that developed a lot of the reprocessing, the recycling technologies that we have 
uh, that's currently in use in the world. So um, it's, it's a good investment on not just the commercial side, but also on the, uh, the research side in terms of the national laboratories. And advanced reactors isn't our only portfolio in terms of nuclear energy work. Uh, we're also uh, doing a lot of work on researching current reactors, analyzing their safety, and what to do with the used nuclear fuel. We have a very large program on research reactors, converting the high enriched uranium to lower enriched uranium um, worldwide. In addition, as I mentioned, we have a very strong chemical engineering department um, with different separation technologies. And we have advanced modeling simulation of just not just the neutrons, but also the fluids as well, and a lot of experimental facilities. And in addition, we have non-energy applications, such as uh, because there's many uses for, for neutrons, such as detection, nuclear forensics, non-destructive evaluation. So that's a lot of information. I'm sorry. But if you were to take only a few things away, uh, these are some of the, the highlights. The performance of nuclear reactors is determined by the neutron energy spectrum. Our existing fleet are all light water cooled reactors using thermal or slow neutrons. Advanced reactors can be designed to be dominated by either thermal or fast neutrons, or, or a little bit of both. Many combinations of these design parameters exist to give you a very diverse uh, portfolio of different advanced reactors. The advanced fast reactors have the best, have the highest potential uh, benefit in terms of waste reduction and resource utilization, as I've shown you with the 10 boxes and the five yard line waste. And that's because of the physics. However, other advanced reactors also have potential advantages, but in terms of economics, process heat, operations, etc. And lastly, getting to any of these advanced designs requires significant research and development support from the government, clear licensing pathways so we can operate them on a commercial scale in the US, continued public support from people like you, so we greatly appreciate you guys coming here, and continued outreach by people like us so that we can close that knowledge gap between the public and the research sector. So if you're interested in more information, uh, I don't have all the links here, but there is a handout on your way out that you can take. So, and they're divided by the different categories of information. There's general information, uh, history of nuclear, future of nuclear, uh, and these are not just websites, but recommended documentaries and, and books as well. And for those of you with a scientific background, um, there's links for that as well. So again, we really appreciate you guys coming. Um, thank you so much, and I think we have some time for questions. Thank you, Francesco and Bo. Great job. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks. So nuclear engineering 101, you ready for your test? <laughs> Took me four years down in Urbana to get that. You just got it in 45 minutes. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, they did a great job. I mean, uh, you know, we, I came here at Argonne first in 1985. and. Um, and I worked on some of these technologies at the, at the at IFR and some of these these things, and and uh, and then we went through kind of a tough period in the late '90s where we thought things were kind of going to go away, and uh, and then you know gas prices got high, and and nuclear was kind of coming back, and we got some great young people back into the field, and. And we, we're kind of facing a little bit of another challenge now, but I, I you know, I'm, we, we really believe here at Argonne that nuclear is, a, is an important component of our energy system, and, and, and it's just great to see these, these, uh, these great young scientists uh, working on it, really excited about that. So we've got a couple, time for a couple questions. Yes? We have a microphone, too. Oh, hold on. We're going to give you a microphone. Uh, thank you. And number one, two questions. Number one, uh, since you guys are developing these things, who gets, I mean, do you license this technology to these commercial companies like GE and all this stuff so that I as a taxpayer am going to get some kind of benefit out of this? That's one question. And, and secondly, I heard that the Soviets uh, did develop some small nuclear reactor that they've used in some of these space uh, uh, objects and what kind of a cooling system does that use? So one technical and one about the money. 
Okay, so I'm gonna take over the Soviet uh, question because uh, during my PhD actually I designed a, f a space reactor uh, for um, NASA had a little bit of a, had a couple dollars for s a few subcontractors, so my advisor actually got a couple dollars out of that to, to, to study that. And so we uh, got to design a, um, a reactor for um, a supposed mission to Mars was an um, unmanned mission to Mars. So that was actually something uh, that was interesting. You, the, the flight was supposed to take 30 years or something like that. And um, I learned a lot of things I didn't know much. Uh, they, they, they were counting on electrical propulsion for, uh, for the space uh, ship. So essentially, instead of having simple combustion and, and ejecting gases, you would use the electricity from the reactor to accelerate, to essentially ionize uh, hydrogen in this case, and shoot out the, the proton, the, the nucleus of the hydrogen with an electromagnetic force so that you get more momentum. And so I got to um, learn a few things just out of curiosity. Does anybody know how much it costs to, um, to lift anything in space? My first design had lead as coolant because it's really a fast um, thing. And, and when I had the first meeting with the subcontractor of NASA, they looked at lead and they said, no, you're gonna change that. <laughs> and, and so they, they told me, um, so that's going along the coolant, and they, so they told me how much it costs to lift anything in space. Any guesses? Actually, $10,000 a kilogram. So. <laughs> So I was, was like, no, lead is not a good choice. So we used, <laughs> so we ended up using lithium in that case. And I think the, the Soviet had a snap uh, design, was it called snap uh, core. That was pretty old actually. And I was working with a guy from Lithuania that actually could read uh, the Soviet's magazines in Russian. And so we got, uh, we got to see how their design looked like. And I think they had um, hydride fuel and I think they had, I don't remember if they had actually water to cool the core, but I, I, would be, I could be wrong, I'm not sure. Our had lithium in there. And lithium had the problem that it needed to be enriched, like the uranium, because lithium had two isotopes, lithium-6 and lithium-7. And lithium-6 is a strong neutron absorber, so you cannot put it in the core. You need to use, uh, you need to take all the lithium-6 out, so. So that leaves me with a commercialization question, I guess. Right. Uh, I'll try to answer it, then maybe, Jeff, you can fill in the gaps. Um, but yes. There is an important uh, return on your investment as taxpayer. Absolutely, I agree with you. One of the things that we did, for example, at Argonne as a lab whole, was the battery technology developed is actually in use in the Chevy Bolt today. So we are also looking for that kind of success story in the nuclear field as well. In terms of the actual, the entire reactor design, um, that would require a large commercial side to manufacture it en masse, for example. We did this already for the PWR. Westinghouse took it and commercialized it. We did this for the BWR. Uh, General Electric took it and commercialized it, and we're constantly in conversations with on the commercial side as well. But there also are a lot of um, um, significant uh, technology improvements and patents that we've issued through our nuclear research that you don't hear about every day. Um, a lot of these have to do with algorithms, codes, um, for example, uh, mechanisms for instrumentation and control. So they are out there, but in terms of the, the, the big one, the big reactor that we want to commercialize, uh, we're still working on that. Right, and I, I would just say on the on the commercialization, we do license technologies, and we do uh, garner some royalties that we use to invest to to build up some of our research capabilities and those things. Uh, but uh, I would tell you, don't wait for a dividend payment as a taxpayer. <laughs> so another yes. Oh, um, you mentioned the partnerships. Um, if a company comes to you, one of these startups, and works with you or another scientist, and you see something that alarms you, is there a system in place? Do you have a resp professional responsibility to report that? And if so, to who? And what happens? Or is it just yay capitalism? Because Washington does not care right now. Yeah. So that's an excellent question. And, you know, we are not just scientists, but also taxpayers ourselves and people who in the public who are concerned whenever there's some wild ideas or anything out there. So I can't be specific, but um, we've had a program where we've analyzed every single possible nuclear arrangement or fuel cycle out there that's possible. So if you have a great idea from the commercial side, we are gonna take a look at that and um, see if that fits, where that fits in into our comprehensive list of uh, different fuel cycles. Um, 
So if it doesn't, then of course, you know, we will make notify the uh, developers, or in the cases that they're potentially asking for collaboration, we're going to say, hold on, maybe you want to check this. So there, there is, um, there's also, it's not just the national labs, but also um, academia, industry, and um, on the commercial side, and we constantly have uh, public conferences and we publish in journals. So we're constantly um, in interactions with each other to make sure that uh, we peer review all our work and make sure that there's nothing that comes out that you know, um, defies the, our understanding of engineering. So I've heard of like fusion as a pro possible next generation of like nuclear technologies. I've heard of stuff like general fusion, tri-alpha, triskel, uh, I'm not sure what it's called, like helion or something. And then does Argon have any role of development of fusion technologies or anything? Uh, I think the amount of fusion work is, is limited. We're more focused on fission. Uh, in terms of fusion, what I can answer is um, it's a completely different process. Instead of having the neutron, the f nucleus fall apart, you're fusing deuterium and tritium together with very high energies. But in order to overcome that Coulombic repulsion, you have to heat it up to very high temperatures such as plasma. And that becomes tricky because you have to isolate that and not let it touch anything else because it's hotter than the temperature of the sun. So sure. what they do is, the, the closest design we have is a torus-shaped design. And they're building that. Uh, they're, they're not to the point where they're self-sustaining yet. The burns that they get are in the order of seconds. And recently, they've been able to get more energy than they put into it. So I'm not sure if I should repeat this joke, but fusion, they say, is always 50 years away. But um, it's, it's, it's a fundamental time constant. It never changes. <laughs> but no, I, I, we, have to, we, have, we can't just put all our eggs in one basket. Uh, we, we have to look for an all, above, all of the above strategy and invest in fusion research as well. OK, thanks. I'm going to follow suit with the gentleman ahead of me and piggyback two questions, one financial and one maybe a little more technical. Um, the first question I have is sort of on the, uh, on the order of what kind of scale are the new reactors being considered on? One of the things that seems fairly problematic for um, current generation of nuclear designs and any of the new construction designs is that there's these billion dollar behemoths and, and finding anyone to underwrite the risk for the project management and things like that, you know, you'll start out with a four and a half billion dollar price tag and 15 billion is not even a surprise to people by the end of the project. In fact, I think uh, Westinghouse or Toshiba, whatever they are at this point, just went bankrupt because they couldn't bankroll, uh, you know, a 20 billion dollar price tag on some of the new nuclear plants. So to what extent are sort of the size of the new designs considering, you know, like kind of the, the construction aspect of how do, you, how do you fund these things and get them built in a way that doesn't take 15 years and doesn't require 20 billion bucks. So that's kind of question one. Uh, question two, what kind of hurdles are currently facing, you know, real hurdles to getting what is being considered now into actual implementation? What, what, what's stopping us from, from doing this? All right, Francesca, okay. you going to take both questions? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll take both questions, sure. So, um, yeah, we spent quite a bit of time um, analyzing the economical aspects, myself actually, uh, of, of uh, all those deployments. And it's a very important question, in fact. Uh, thank you for raising that. Um, in fact, we have had uh, very good experiences in the US and also very bad experiences. And um, if you look at the history, for example, we had had reactors around here that were built for very little. People are surprised to hear, for example, that the Palisades reactor in Michigan was built for what today would be $1,000 a kilowatt electric. Now you don't even buy a, a, an open cycle gas turbine for that price. Okay, that, so those were built quickly in four and a half years and for very little money. Now, uh, eventually, there were a, a number of things that uh, started creating those lo large overruns. Now, there's, there's an important thing that we, uh, that we deduced in all our research, which is what's the difference between, um, we need to establish a, a conceptual difference between overruns in a construction project so, uh, and things that instead go on budget, okay? So, uh, and then if you do that conceptual distinction, then you start understanding 
why do you have cost overruns or not? So what, what are the lessons learned for, um, uh, for not starting something and going over budget? So now, if you actually maintain the reactor within budget, and there are lessons that everybody can learn, for example, one very important lesson is to not make changes during the construction. This also applies to everybody. If you start your uh, remodeling of your bathroom at home, and you start having changes while the people are making actually the bathroom at home, it's gonna explode in price. So the rule of thumb is really, the important rule is to never make changes while the project is being constructed. Now, in the United States, we had a, a very rough period for nuclear construction in the 70s, uh, and that was because uh, there was actually regulatory learning. So our, uh, our regulator, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, applies very strict rules and, uh, and have uh, essentially the capability to um, not grandfather any previous construction authorization. And this is for the safety and benefit of the public. So essentially, if you have a something, you, you authorize someone to construct a nuclear plant, and then uh, a, couple a couple years later, while these guys are constructing it, you as nuclear regulator learn that uh, there has to be a better practice than what they've been doing, or something has changed, you have the authority to go and say, okay, you have to change your design, you have to change your construction. And this happened a, a large amount of times of uh, two reactors being constructed after perhaps uh, between 74 and 86 or so. Those years were really rough. There were continuous changes, and so people that were constructing plants found themselves in the boat of essentially not being able to keep the, budget and the, the, the project under budget, and they, they had tremendous cost escalation. Now, if we, have, if we make the assumption nowadays that our regulator has fully learned, because we have actually 40, 50 years of reactor experience, then um, it didn't happen in the previous, in the current uh, situation at the, at the Vogel and Summer that you were referring to, because there was the Fukushima accident in Japan, and this actually uh, created three or four lessons learned or more from the nuclear regulator in the United States, and they imposed changes on the Vogel plants and summer. But if you assume that the regulator has fully learned, then at that point you can say, okay, I'm gonna keep the project steady while I'm constructing it. At, at this point, you should be able to build it on budget, okay? And four billions can be bankrolled. I mean, um, a, a utility can, can find access in financial markets for this type of money, or they can form consortiums. All the Vogel and summer units that are being constructed now uh, have consortiums. Now, to your questions, that's exactly the point of uh, this, uh, the small modular reactors. The idea is to have much smaller units that can be constructed at a much lower total cost. Um, and so at this point, that would, uh, would actually reduce the budget to substantial lower amounts, perhaps half a billion or so per unit. And you can construct them one at a time, start making money and show the investors that that works. And so you keep your cost of capital under control. Does that answer roughly? That's exactly what I was going to say. So. Okay, yeah, thanks. Right. Thank you. How, how are we doing on time? Wind, wind up. A, a, another question or one, one more question and then we'll, we'll wind it up. So let's see. What. Uh, question and an observation. On the high level, what is the most promising what is the commercially one? what is the most commercially promising advanced reactor design? We love fast reactors. Yeah. We love <laughs> sodium fast reactors, but sodium fast we may be biased. Yeah. You can you can fission all the uranium two hundred and thirty eight that yeah. I was mentioning before. And so you would essentially have thousands of years of uranium that's already been mined in the US that you can use for powering all our needs for uh, for a very long yeah, time. We, we, we built these before, we have the experience, we've operated them, um, not connected to the grid, but in the experimental and demonstration levels. And they are commercially connected to the grid. Um, they were in France and they are currently connected to the grid in, in Russia. So but, that, that's the one to write the Congress But it's not, it's not our job to pick technology. So all those startups have, uh, have merits. If it isn't your job, whose is it? Well, it's a marketplace. Eventually, they will develop their products and uh. sell it to the market, and people will decide which one fits best uh, their interest. We, we, I mean, Argon has a strong history with the development of, fast, uh, of sodium fast reactor. Yeah. One observation. 
the Soviet SCA. Union crashed and burned 1991. So we're not competing with them anymore. <laughs> oh, thank you. I got to keep up to date with my news. But we are competing with China, in fact. Uh, and China, China is expected to, over, to overtake the United States in 2026 in terms of total energy produced with nuclear energy. Currently, we are the leaders. We have 100 reactors, 99 actually. And uh, Russia is ex uh, China is expected to uh, reach that level by 2026. So and then eventually they will pass us and become the leaders. Great. Yes. Oh. Okay, good. Well, I think we've got a, we've got a, this has been a great conversation. And uh, if you could just thank our speakers again.